In this video lecture, we'll have a first look at penalized regression. First, some definitions. Define the LQ norm of a vector, x, which has k elements, as follows. So we take the sum of the elements to the power q, and then take the sum to the power 1 minus q. Now, formally, this is only a norm if q is larger or equal to 1. If q is smaller or equal to 1, then the triangle inequality is not satisfied. But we can still define the quantity also for q smaller than 1. And note that we can calculate it, of course, for any q also smaller than 1. Now we're going to also add q equal to infinity, where q equal to infinity is a subnorm, meaning it's the largest value of the elements of xj. As with k is finite, of course, then we can also just take, state it as the maximum. Now, by writing a norm to the power q norm to the power q, we actually just get, of course, the sum of the xj to the power q. And in the same reasoning, we can add q equal to 0. So this would be then the L0 norm, which actually only counts if the uh, if elements are non-zero or not. So every element we take to the power 0, where we the convention is that 0 to the power 0 is 0, anything else to the power 0 is 1. So we can write it in terms of the indicator as just the sum of uh, the number of elements which are non-zero. So this allows us to count how many elements in a vector beta are actually not zero. And of course, if we have a, a certain uh, set S of elements that are non zero, then writing the L zero norm of beta is the same as writing as the same as the cardinality of that set S. So why did we do all this notation? Well, we want to go from variable selection towards penalized regression. So let's go, let's look back at what we did for uh, model selection, where we had the information criteria that minimized the log of the residual uh, sum of squares plus some penalty term Cn over n times the number of variables, which we can now write using this uh, L0 norm of beta. Now, this is nothing different. We just rewrote and we call lambda Cn over n. Now, what we, what we want to do is we want to combine model selection and estimation in a single step. Now, note that in fact, what we could do is we could define information criteria without the logarithm here. So we could define it directly uh, on the sum of square residuals. So could we possibly do that in, then in one go? Could we minimize this thing plus this penalty term directly? And so what we, what we did before was we looked at all sets S, including or excluding certain variables in our model. And based on that, we then looked at which of these, all of these models gave us the lowest value for the information criterion. But the problem, of course, there was that we had two to the power p models to evaluate. Now, if we could do that in one go, it would be, of course, uh, easier. We don't have to, not necessarily have to go through all of these models, all of these sets as. Now, the, we can, of course, do that, but this L0 norm still means counting non-zero elements in there. So this L0 norm will actually still be problematic because if you have to count, it also means this is something which is non-differentiable. So we want to extend that to what we call the penalized least squares estimator, where instead of an L0 norm, we take an LQ norm or an LQ norm to the power Q. It's the same idea. So we have a part that measures the fit 
And we have a penalty term that penalizes two complex models, having too, mu too many variables uh, in there. If you want to, don't want to write it in, in, in matrix notation, we can write it like this in regular, uh, regular sum notation. And um, we call this thing also a regularizer because it's, it's going to uh, put a penalty on things which are too complex. And so we again have this interpretation on the one hand, lack of fit, on the other hand, complexity. And we want to minimize some sort of um, weighted sum of these, where lambda is going to determine how much emphasis we put on the penalty versus the lack of fit. Now, the best way to analyze what's going to happen if we do this is to look at, at the constraint minimization form. And so, of course, we, can, we could recognize the, this expression here as the Lagrangian of a constraint minimization problem where our object, objective function is just the usual least squares, but we have a constraint saying that the LQ norm to the power Q of beta is, has to be smaller equal to M, where M is some constant and how large it is will depend on how large lambda is. So we're doing these squares, but we don't want our parameter vector to become too large. Because two large parameter vectors vector means your model is too complex. Now, of course, it depends on the shape here of this constraint, what actually will happen to this estimator. So let's take p equal to 2, because there we can write things out explicitly. And we can write out the residual sum of squares um, for two variables, while the constraint has this form. And now what we can do is we can plot contour lines. So we take a certain value c and then plot all betas for which the residual sum of squares has the same value c. So if we optimize it, the least square solution, there's of course only one single point which has that, um, that value. But if we then make the, sum, the residual sum of squares larger, we get these contour lines for different values of c. And then we can see where actually our contour lines hit our constraint. So let's first take q equal to 2. So let me go back one slide. We get here beta 1 squared plus beta 2 squared small equal to m. So this, of course, then is actually the area of a circle. So you can see the constraint here in this red circle. We see the least square solution here. So this one value for beta 1, beta 2 gives us the optimum value for least squares. Now, we also see that this is outside of the constraint. So this would not be a solution to our constraint minimization problem. Then we, we move away from the optimum. So we look at these contour lines and we start moving away and moving away until we hit here. We are tangent to the constraint. We don't have to go any further, of course, because that would mean actually worsening the residual sum of squares while you already satisfy the constraint. So our solution here will be at this point. Now let's look at q equal to 1.5. So do you see that the circle is becoming a bit less round in a way? So it's becoming less of a circle, it's going, going more towards the square, but of course it isn't a square. And we see that well, now our solution is, is here. Now, the interesting case comes when Q is equal to one. So here, our constraint is that the sum of the absolute values should be small equal to M. So this gives us this square form here. And something interesting is happening here. Because we have these absolute values, we get sharp points here. We don't get non-differentiable points here on these edges. These come, of course, directly from the absolute value. So these points here mean that actually you can end up in exact zeros for some coefficients. And that is indeed what happens in this particular case. So again, our least square solution is here. 
we move away towards the constraint and we see that we hit the constraint here exactly where beta 2 is 0. Now the only reason why this could happen is because we have these sharp points. So if you go back one, here for instance we don't have, we, everything is differentiable. So the probability that you end up on exactly the axis is 0. Here this probability is larger than 0 simply because we have this non-differentiable point. Now if we go further, we, for q equal to a half here, we see that we are much more likely to end up on a point where some of these variables are zero, in this case, where beta 2 is equal to zero. But we also see that our constraint region is not convex anymore, right? You can take a linear combination between two points and end up outside of your constraint. While here it's still convex for q equal to one. And of course, larger than, than one, everything is also convex. Now convexity is important because convexity allows us to have efficient algorithms to calculate the solution. So here we have the problem that we cannot move, if we, we move linear ways, we can actually go outside of the constraint, which makes uh, optimization problematic. So what we have is that if Q is larger than one, we are moving towards zero because we are moving towards the constraint, which is centered at zero. So we're shrinking towards zero, but will not end up with any coefficients being exactly equal to zero. On the other hand, if Q is smaller than equal to one, we're not only shrinking towards zero, but we're also doing variable selection because we end up with a positive probability of setting some coefficients exactly equal to zero. So in this, if that, from that perspective, this seems a nicer approach. But on the other hand, as I also already mentioned, we want convexity and we only have convexity if Q is larger or equal to one. Whereas we have concavity for Q smaller than one. And this is clearly a, a big problem because we cannot apply all tools for convex optimization, which make our life much easier and get us much faster uh, and more stable computational results. Well, so that's obviously means that Q is equal to one is those one special case where we have both. We have variable selection and we have convexity. So this Q equal to one is a special case. And this one is actually known as the lasso or the lasso, depending on how you want to pronounce it, which stands for least absolute shrinkage and selection operator was proposed in 1996 by Dick Shirani. This is then, of course, the case that we will study in great detail. But first we go to Q equal to two, because for Q equal to two, we actually get very nice, simple analytical solutions. This is called rich regression. This is very old because in fact, it's, there's no optimization needed because everything is analytically a solution. And this one already, Q equal to two, already can illustrate some of the things such as training of variance and bias that underlie the idea of penalized regression. So we'll first study this, and then in the next lecture, we'll start studying the lasso. So how do we get this analytical solution for rich regression? Well, this, uh, what we need to solve. So actually the Q's here should be equal to two. I will update the slides uh, and make and correct these uh, typos. So Q is equal to two. So this we can write also as just the inner product of the, of the betas. And it's the sum of the coefficients squared. Well, this is, of course, a very standard problem. It's pretty much what we solve if we want to find the least squares estimator, except that now we have this term, this additional term here. Now I'm going to slightly rewrite stuff. So I'm going to work this part out. And then we'll see if we get this expression here. The reason why I do that is because you now see the similarity to these squares. So we don't even have to do the full derivation, but already here you can see that where for these squares we, just, we have x prime x, here we have x prime x plus this term depending on the penalty. And the, the i here is the identity matrix. 
So it will not surprise you that if we do the derivation, we get something which is very similar to these squares. So we, of course, we can get the first derivative, which looks like this. Right? So here's the beta, which is going to disappear at this point two. Then we get a two here, which is the square. And then we set it equal to zero to solve. Well, as I said, instead of the x prime x for these squares, we have now this additional penalty term. So our bridge regression looks like the least like least squares, except that in the denominator we add something, something diagonal. Now, one of the nicest things about this is that it directly allows you to deal with high dimensionality. Note that if you would do least squares, you would get x prime x. But if p is larger or equal to n, x prime x is singular, because uh, the columns are linear combinations of each other. So you cannot calculate x prime x inverse. It doesn't exist. The matrix is not invertible. Now, the nice thing is that if you add this diagonal term, which depends on this lambda, this will always be invertible for any lambda larger than 0. So we can have a quick look at why this is the case. So this is a bit of linear algebra. Remember, for a singular matrix, x prime x, a symmetric matrix, the minimum eigenvalue is equal to zero. Now, what is the minimum eigenvalue then of this thing, which is, of course, still a symmetric matrix? Well, remember the definition of eigenvalues and eigenvectors? Take a matrix A, then it has its eigenvalue and eigenvector are such that if we multiply A by the, the, the eigenvector V, it's equal to mu times V. So we know that for the matrix X prime X, one of the values for which this is true is actually zero. And all the other ones, all the other mu's are uh, larger than zero. Now consider adding something to the matrix lambda times the identity matrix. Uh, the n, of course, doesn't matter, so I've sort of absorbed that here in my lambda. So we can add that, of course, on both sides here of this definition. So add uh, lambda v here, add lambda v here, and then, of course, this thing turns out to be a plus lambda i times v. Now, on the right hand side, we also get mu plus lambda times v. So this directly tells us that, that this is again an eigenvalue statement. Right? So the eigenvalues of this matrix a plus lambda i are actually the eigenvalues of the original matrix plus lambda. So all eigenvalues are increased by lambda. So the, one, the eigenvalues that are zero, the, the ones that are actually causing the, the non-invertibility, they will all become positive. So all eigenvalues of this thing here will be larger than zero, and that means you have an invertible matrix. Now let's see what it does, this rich regression to our bias and variance of our estimator. Let's try to link our rich regression to least squares. So, what I'm going to do here is take the rich regression and I'm going to insert x prime x, x prime x inverse. Of course, we're doing it here under cases where actually the least squares estimator exists. Now, you recognize the least squares estimator here, so we can replace it. And I also want to where I don't like to have this in the in the inverse here times that. So I want to slightly rewrite that. So I'm going to add here to x prime x. I'm going to add n times lambda i minus n times lambda i. And then we see, of course, that this is the red part here. The inverse is equal to this part. So that will give us the identity matrix. And we then have left is and lambda times the identity times this inverse here. So that's this part that we subtract. So what we can see is that actually what we do is we are matrix multiplying the least squares uh, estimator 
where the matrix Q that we multiply with looks like this. So if you look at it informally, you already see it's, some, it's I minus something, and this thing will be small and positive. So we're in a way we are making the least squares estimator closer to zero because we are multiplying by something less than one. Again, that is very informal to say it like that, but that is the idea. And that means that if we calculate the expectation of the rich estimator, we can do that in terms of the least squares estimator. Um, well, do the law of iterated expectations, condition on X. We know that this matrix Q only depends on X, so we can take it out of that conditional expectation. And um, this conditional expectation is equal to beta. So the expectation of the, least, of the rich uh, estimator is the expectation is beta times the expectation of this matrix Q. Now, as I already said informally, this matrix Q is something smaller than one. If you want to say it a bit more formally, you can actually say that it's, it's of a smaller order than the identity in terms of positive definiteness. So the rich estimator multiplying beta with something smaller than one is going to uh, be biased towards zero. And this of course makes sense because it exactly matches what we saw in the, in the graphic representation. So that's not good, you might think, but as I already mentioned, we might actually gain stuff by allowing for more bias, if that means our variance becomes less. So we can also do a similar argument for the variance, where we look at the variance of the rich estimator, again, writing it in terms of the least squares estimator. And so we now have the least squares, the variance of the least squares estimator, multiplied, pre and post multiplied by this matrix Q, which is smaller than one. So, so the identity minus Q is positive semi-definite. And that makes this whole thing smaller than the variance of the least squares estimator. So we're going to, by the same operation, we're going to reduce the variance of our estimator. So we are trading bias, but we're actually getting lower variance. And of course, depending on how we do that, it might, it might actually lead to a lower, lower overall MSE. And so this very simple rich estimator can actually already handle high dimensionality and do so in a much more, uh, much better way than, than least squares. Provided even least squares you can actually calculate, right? So if P is larger than N, you cannot even do least squares. Now, this is not optimal, of course, because we're doing sort of brute force approach. So we're not selecting variables, we're just pushing everything towards zero. And that makes, of course, the limitation uh, to have, makes it have quite some limitations in, in practice. You might actually be better off if you did variable selection, because then you would have to push, you would have to shrink less towards zero. And this is exactly what the lasso is doing. And so this will be analyzed in, in the next video.